to four. Do you have a gardening problem? We can help you with that. A program dedicated to help you grow a better garden, maintain your landscape, grow healthier trees, make that grass look a little bit greener, as well as preserving what you grow. We're here to help you with your gardening problem. You're tuned in to Garden Talk Radio. You're listening to the most informational-packed hour of garden-focused radio in the country and on the Internet with your host, husband and wife team, Joey and Holly Baird. This is the Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener Radio Show. Welcome to the Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener Radio Show. The Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener Radio Show is presented to you by Power Planter Earth Augers, the official digging tool. To find the right size for your digging project, visit powerplanter.com. Thank you for taking time out of your day to join us to talk gardening for the next hour. Whether you're listening through your radio on one of the 16 stations our show is being broadcasted on here in 2020, through a radio app or through our website. That website is the Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener.com. Under the Season 4 tab at the top of the page, podcast replay or in-studio video replay, thank you very much. I am your host, Joy Baird. Beside me is my wife, co-host, best friend, and gardening partner. Holly Baird. This program is for you, about you, to help your garden grow better, to maintain your landscape, to have healthier trees, to grow greener grass preserving what you grow indoors and out. There are several ways in which you can get a hold of us. Uh, we're going to give you two of them today. Uh, you can go to our website and find more, but you can give us an e- you can send us an email at gardentalkradio at gmail.com. That's gardentalkradio at gmail.com. We'll get your question answered, as well as you can give us a call anytime, day or night. Our number is 1-800-927-SHOW. That's one 800 927 S H O W. We've got a big show lined up for you today. In the first segment, we're going to talk about five problems you're probably going to face with your tomatoes. And in the second segment, we're going to talk about nematodes, the good ones and the bad ones. And our guest will be Pam Farley, new author, and we'll answer your garden questions. So we should get in the program, Holly, and let's get into some of the common problems and maybe some of the uh, more extreme problems that people may face with their tomato plants this year. Many of us, if not all of us, have them in the ground, and there's going to be problems. It's not going to be plant them now, harvest them in 90 days, and everything's happy and go lucky. You're going to have some issues, and we need to be proactive instead of reactive with these situations. Sure. So the first one we have here is early blight. And early blight, you know you have early blight because you'll get this yellowing of the bottom leaves of your tomato plant. If you don't do anything, That yellowing is going to spread. Leaves are going to die off. Pretty soon you just have like this stick with uh, some tomatoes growing on it. So early blight is actually a bacteria that's in your soil. There's many good things in your soil. There's also many bad things. And early blight grows in everybody's soil. It just lives there. But what you can do is that since that early blight lives there and can get onto your tomato plants is because of the splashing up of water, rain, what have you, Splashes as splashes on the tomato plant and causes that early blight issue. So there's a few things, different things that you can do. One is you can trim around the bottom of your tomato plants about six inches from, you know, the bottom of the plant down to the soil level. To the soil level, and you just go ahead trim those branches off, and you would do this throughout the season um, as they as they grow and sprout there, and that helps part of it. Another thing you can do is take a handful of whole grain cornmeal and put that around the base of the plant. So you just want to get a little bit more than the cheapo kind. You want to get the whole grain. Name brand. Name brand. Name brand. This is your tomatoes. These are your babies. (laughs) Right. They're worth it. Um, You take a handful of that and you put it around the base of the plant. So you want to trim them, take this cornmeal, do that. And then finally, you want to mulch. And mulch is going to help keep the moisture in. It's going to shade the roots of your plant, suppress weeds, and also prevents that splashing up. Now, when you're watering the plants, you can definitely water at the base of the plants or if you use irrigation. But Mother Nature doesn't care what your plants when it's raining. So that's why you want to mulch. And you can mulch with anything from um, straw, not hay, but straw. You can, If you have leaves that you collected from last fall, you can definitely use those. Um, or you can use shredded paper. You can use pine needles and you can use 
what we call is chemical free grass clipping. So if you or somebody else is spraying your grass with some sort of persistent herbicide, do not use those grass clippings. We want to use just regular grass clippings and you want to dry them out a bit before you use them as mulch because if you don't dry them out, they they could they could possibly mold. And then if they're wet and then they dry, they'll clump together and the water can't get through them mm-hmm. in order to properly water the plants. Now, uh, even if you have a, a in-ground or uh, ground-level irrigation system, you still want to dry them and then place them on top of that irrigation system. You, you just don't want to throw the, the wet ones on there because of that fungal issue. And you can just spread them on your yard or on your driveway, what have you. They'll dry quickly in the sun. So uh, trim the bottom six to eight inches. Apply yellow whole grain cornmeal at the time of planting and if you want to, halfway through the growing season and mulch regularly to prevent a barrier or to create a barrier of soil from the soil to the plant to reduce the splash up. Uh, next one is leaf curl. Now this is may not be the more popular one, but curling of the tomato leaves may be a sign of a viral infection. Normally this, this virus is transmitted through white fly or through in infected transplants. So if you got a transplant uh, from a shoddy or um, El Cheapo garden center or back of a truck this may be kind of uh the issue although physiologically uh the effort the the efforts for the tomato leaf curl does not ultimately affect the overall crop or the crop yield of the the plant when the tomato leaf curl it is due to the viral infection infection so we want to remove the infected part of the plant when necessary, if possible. Now, if the whole plant is infected, you can't just, you know, you're going to have to remove the whole plant. You really want to look at the guidelines of no more than 25% of removal of leaves uh, in order to help sustain and put the plant in a, a lesser of a shock. Uh, but if need be, you can uh, remove, you know, more than 25% of the plant. The key to managing the leaf curl th- is through prevention, uh, so as you see it happen, you want to continue to remove those infected leaves and if need be, protect the plant with a floating row cover that will uh, keep the white fly invasion at bay, um, you know, that type of thing. There's other uh, things in which you can use in order to keep the plant uh, somewhat healthy, um, but that that's the main thing. If you see a leaf curl, it's it's something that you need to be aware of. Okay, so then our third one is blossom end rot, and this is another Right now issue. it's a more popular one. It's one of the most popular ones on social media because tomatoes are being formed, and they're showing the black rotten portion of the bottom of the tomato, which is what is called blossom end rot. So blossom end rot is the lack of access of calcium to your plants. It's not the lack of el- a lack of calcium in your soil necessarily. It's a lack of access that your plants are having. Um, so what happens is that many of us plant our plant our tomatoes. It's late spring. We get a nice rain. We keep getting a few nice rains, and then it doesn't start to rain for a while. And, and a light rain doesn't mean a good rain. No, we we're talking about soaking rains. Um, but you think, oh well, you know, I should probably water my plants, but it rained two days ago. I'll get it tomorrow. I'll get it tomorrow. <laughs> Pretty soon, you have your plants are fruiting. You have that brown grossness on the bottom of your tomatoes and it's because that calcium is locked up into your soil but you go online and you read do this this and this you water your plants and then it gets rid of that and you think oh well that must have been the solution when all along it was just watering the plants consistently to help keep all of those nutrients flowing nicely through the plants you have to have moisture in order to transmit the nutrients and the nutrients is uh, through the the system of the soil into the plant. That's how it works. A dry soil does not re- uh, allow the plant to uptake those things. Then we also have late blight, and unfortunately, late blight does happen to the best of us. We we've experienced it once. Way it was it was in the November month uh, because we had such a long growing season. Now what? Late blight, it does happen later on the season, hence the name late blight, and it becomes, it infects your plant to where you have black and gray and brown spotches, not only on the stems and the limbs, but also on the fruit, and the fruit is inedible at that point, so you do not want to eat it. Uh, there is some ways in which you can be proactive in the, uh, 
prevention of late blight, and that's by copper fungicides you can spray. But however, if the if the plant has already been infected with the late blight, the copper fungicide that you spray on it is does not work. It will not work. So if you do have late blight on your tomatoes, you do not you want to get rid of them. You don't want to eat the fruit. And when I mean get rid of them, don't put them in your compost pile. Don't put them in the city's compost pile for municipality pickup. If you keep those spores warm enough over the winter months, then you will introduce that late blight into your garden far earlier in the growing season than what is traditionally uh, uh, in the garden later in the season. Now, Holly, what is how how does late blight come into your garden? What are we are we touching something or what is occurring that allows that late blight to get into the garden and start infecting not only our tomatoes, but it can be our tomatoes, too, and occasionally the possibility of eggplants and peppers uh, in that instance, too. But we're predominantly affects the tomato portions of your garden. Sure. So what happens is that it's spread through through the wind. Um what occurs is that the this in, it's called infestants are they either have survived over winter and then spread because of the wind, um, but they yeah. So if you have even if you get rid of your plants, put them in the garbage, and you have late blight, it doesn't mean that everybody's doing that. And then you're the good gardener. You're, you're the good gardener, but maybe your neighbor is not, or not your direct neighbor, but maybe your neighbor. You know, five right. miles away because it spreads through the wind and it typically typically goes through a county or a couple counties. And so that's why we want you to throw those plants away. And our final one, Holly, is? This is um, Septoria leaf spots. This is uh, this is known to be a, a very popular one uh, for a variety of reasons. And uh, how does one get this and how does one uh, treat this, Holly? Um, so... It looks like basically you have these dark spots on your tomato uh, leaves, um, and then the then eventually they fall off your plant. And this is a fungus, and this fungus is active from about sixty eight to seventy seven degrees Fahrenheit, and when the humidity is high. So we might not we might not get it as right. much where we are, but other locations. Now we're in Zone Five A mm-hmm. uh, up up in the uh, southeast Wisconsin area. Um, um, but certain and certain tomatoes are more susceptible, um, just depending on what the variety is. But what you can do is you want to make sure you're not using overhead irrigation because that will, if it's humid where you are, that's going to increase the water or the humidity. Um, and you just want to make sure that you are using, if you need to use a fungicide application, and then you would use that as like a foiler, foil. Foliage, foliar, yeah. foliar spray, and then don't, um, and then you don't plant the tomatoes in the same place year after year. At least a three-year absence in a certain area uh, for those tomato plants to be uh, in that place. Uh, but also overhead watering. If it rains, it happens. Uh, but do not. You don't want to incorporate and be part of the problem uh, with that. Now that. So com- if you've had if you've had this issue before, and you live in an area with high humidity, make sure you're also spacing your plants. Mm-hmm. Because air circulation air, is key. Yeah, air circulation is key. And that goes with anything that might get some sort of mold or mildew or fungus uh, growth, like powdery mildew for viney, for viney squash and things like that. So you definitely want to make sure you're, you're spacing them apart properly. And if you are in an area where you have that high humidity and there's places all over the country, talk to the local university, talk to the garden center and go, hey, what do you recommend? Because there are... Uh, there, you know, worldwide, there's about 10,000 different varieties of tomatoes. Uh, now, not all of them are commercially available, but however, different tomatoes grow better in different geographical areas. A tomato that does really good in South Florida, probably not going to do as well in northern Wisconsin or the Dakotas. So we want to keep that in mind. So those are five of about 10 billion different problems you can have with your tomatoes. So we hopefully that has enlightened you a little bit in order to figure out what to be aware of, what to prevent, what to be proactive instead of reactive with. Sure. Well, thank you for taking the time out of your day to listen to our show. This is our 16th show of 2020. Did you miss last week's show? We talked about... I I didn't. I was here. (laughs) About what your plants are telling you and what they need. And then five jobs that still need to be done in the garden, even if it's already planted. Our guest was author Julie Cerny. 
And you can listen to that show by going to your favorite podcast platform and searching Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener Podcast. Or we'll make it easier for you. Just go ahead and send us an email to gardentalkradio at gmail.com. And in the subject line, just put show uh, 15 and we will send you the link. We will be right back. Do not go anywhere. We'll be talking about nematodes in the garden. Um, the Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener, you are listening to a program to help you grow a better garden, maintain your landscape, help your trees grow better, make the grass look greener, and preserving what you grow for indoor and out. Got a question for Joey and Holly? Send it via email anytime to gardentalkradio at gmail.com. If you love growing tomatoes, then you've got to try Tomato Secret by Dr. Jim. At the Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener, we stand behind Tomato Secret and recommend it to all gardeners who would easily like to grow higher quality tomatoes with more color, more flavor, and less bugs and disease. Tomato Secret is specifically designed to grow high quality tomatoes that is made with 12 natural ingredients so pure that you can feed it to a cow. Simply apply one cup in the hole at planting and sprinkle one cup around the plant after one month. That is all it takes for the best tomatoes on earth. With this product, you do not have to guess what is wrong with your tomato plant because it has everything your plants need to be healthy and produce the most delicious fruit. You'll never grow tomatoes the same again. Grow the largest, juiciest, and most delicious tomatoes on earth. To find out more about Tomato Secret and other products, visit drjims.com. That's D-R-J-I-M-Z.com. The new way to support your tomatoes, wrap it and snap it, tomatosnaps.com. Looking to kill weeds without using dangerous chemicals like glyphosate? An all-natural weed killer may be just what you're looking for. Green Gobbler's Vinegar Weed Killer is a concentrated herbicide derived naturally from corn. It's four times stronger than regular table vinegar, so it packs a punch against all kinds of pesky weeds. Use Green Gobbler's Vinegar Weed Killer to safely kill dandelions, crabgrass, clover, ivy, and more. It's perfect for driveways, pavers, fence lines, and other outdoor surfaces. Green Gobbler Vinegar Weed Killer is an effective and powerful herbicide, but it doesn't stop there. It's also certified for organic use, so when used properly, it won't negatively affect soil or wildlife. Since Green Gobbler's Vinegar Weed Killer is pure vinegar with no other additives, pet owners can let their pets out to play right after application. Search for Green Gobbler Vinegar Weed Killer on Amazon.com today. We offer a hassle-free money-back guarantee, so you have nothing to lose. Protect your plants against damage with a 3-in-1 plant guard and special blend fertilizer. Visit IVOrganics.com. Do not go anywhere. There is more of the Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener radio show to come which is presented to you by Power Planter Earth Augers, the official digging tool. To find the right size for your digging project, visit powerplanter.com. Trim Bin turns any chair into a workstation. Comfortably sort your herbs, dried flowers, cannabis, and more. Easily collect pollen with a static brush and mirror finish collection tray. High walls keep your work contained. To get yours, visit harvest-more.com. Made in California. The Simply Solar Greenhouse is a one-piece molded fiberglass greenhouse that is easy to install and maintain. Multiple sizes available. Check them all out at migreenhouse.com. Responsible watering. Accurate, fast, and efficient. Earth conscious. Visit waterhoop.com. Com. Blue Mel's Garden and Landscape Center offers an awesome selection of high-quality garden and landscape products. We have just the plants you're looking for, annuals, perennials, veggies, herbs, and more. Plus, you can always count on us to answer all of your questions and offer expert advice. Blue Mel's also carries the largest selection of bulk landscape materials in the area. Enjoy a beverage from our coffee shop while your kids run around in our huge playground. Join our growing list of highly satisfied customers. Visit the garden center that offers everything you're looking for. Visit Blue Mel's today. Blue Mel's 4930 West Loomis Road, 414-282-4220. The Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener Radio Show is brought to you by the following. Phylum Bioproducts, Spartan Mosquito, Dr. Jim's, Nasala Kabucha, MI Greenhouse LLC, Green Gobbler, Water Hoop, Seed Savers Exchange. Find all sponsors at the Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener.com and thank them for their support. Now back to the Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener Radio Show, which is presented to you by Power Planter Earth Augers, the official digging tool to find the right size for your digging project. Visit PowerPlanter.com. Now here are your hosts, Joey and Holly Baird. Welcome back to the Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener a Radio Show. Did you know that your soil is alive? It's a living, breathing 
item. It has millions and billions of things in it, not only things that you can physically see with your eye, but microscopically there are hundreds and millions of different things in that soil, and nematodes are one of those. Right, so let's talk about what nematodes are, Okay. besides something that lives in your soil. Um, they are a tiny little microscopic animal. <laughs> they organism, are organism. organism. Yeah. They're a decomposer. They're often referred to as round worms, but they are not related to the earthworm. They're more of a, um, like, a, um, closer to like a fungus almost okay. because they, they break stuff down. And they are the kind of the, the mediator between compost and breaking it down to a usable form for the plant to uptake. Right. So some nematodes feed outside of the plant and some kind of burrow into the plant. Okay. But they live in the soil. So they, they go to the roots of the plant. So some of them will kind of like work their way into the roots and some of them work around the roots. Um, but the, the good new nematodes break the, the stuff down. Um, they can be beneficial to the soil in that way. The bad nematodes cause the damage. So when they are working their way into the roots, they're damaging the cell walls of the roots, which then in turn damages your plants because if you damage the cell walls of the roots, the roots can't bring the, the food from the soil. And they can, into the plant. they inject their saliva into the cells of the plant and can introduce viruses and diseases to them, the plants. And that's why you're looking at a plant going, I'm not really sure what's wrong with this. Well, a lot, if not the majority, if not almost all the problems that your plant's going to face, a small percentage is above the soil. Many of it is due to what's going on beneath the soil. Yeah, you're going to have hornworms and cabbage moths and all that stuff. But when you look at the overall percentage of problems that your plant faces or issues it could have, below the soil is is your top uh, top percentage. Right. And so they are... Um different that's for sure so they are most of harmless but they they can cause problems and one thing that the good ones do is they get rid of some pest species that could be causing problems for your your garden and that includes weevils um the clear wing borers cutworms webworms cinch bugs and white grubs so what happens is they attack and kill these pests by either um, injecting a a bacteria into them or becoming using them as their host. Okay. So all nematodes have these like little tiny mouths that have like a bunch of teeth. So they're almost kind of parasitic, like a leech. Okay. Now, yeah. if you have bad nematodes and, and the only re, only way you're going to figure out if you have bad nematodes is it's not you walk out of the garden and go, well, that soil is that color. That's bad nematode area. And this soil has that color and that means those are good ones unless you see uh and you plant a plant in the ground and you start seeing effects on that plant and it's not from above then one of your telltale signs is it could be that you have bad nematodes if you bought that plant from a questionable uh, retailer or friend that has uh, bad nematodes in the soil that is a way of what transferring them into your garden. Uh, but if you've grown in the same area for decades, if not a lifetime, and you've never had ill plants, then you don't have to necessarily worry about the issue of having bad nematodes in your soil. I know there's places like in South Florida where you ha- they have to do raised beds because the soil is so negatively, negatively impacted by the bad nematodes that they just convert to raised beds, and, and that's how they do things. Right. So one thing you want to keep in mind is with the, the bad nematodes is if you do have that problem, you would want to pull that plant out. You could sprinkle um, some diatomaceous earth in the soil and then and then mix it up, and that will help kind of get rid of the bad nematodes. But also throughout the season, if you feel you have that nematode problem, just keep kind of disturbing the soil in that spot. Yeah, you keep on to till it uh, over the course of the growing season, the winter months, expose the nematodes to the environment uh, where the roots were at. Throw that soil, you know, till that up, 
and the freezing temperatures and the dry, cold winds will help kill some of those surviving nematodes. Now, it's not necessarily you're going to get rid of all of them because there's it is it is okay to have some bad nematodes in the soil. Mm -hmm. You just don't want to have that overpopulation of them that controls everything that's going on, which is detrimental to the plants. Right. Another thing is, as Joey had mentioned, you know, bringing them from the garden center to your home. Another thing is, is if you feel that you might have bad nematodes, and just in general, like if you have maybe garden shoes that you think could have some sort of pest on them, you don't want to keep chomping them, chomping them around your garden. Same thing with like shovels, trowels. Clippers, yeah, yeah, if you're going from your backyard to the community garden to a friend's backyard, this is where not only nematodes but the jumping worm eggs can be transferred over. Um, how do you know if you have bad nematodes? Well, there are signs of stunted plant loss and vigorous reduction of yield, unusual growth habits, and when you dig the plant up the roots, you can visually see that there is something not uh, can, not right with those roots. They're damaged. And uh, this is a, a, a per persistent problem when you have nematode infestation. And the best situation which you can do is everything when we talk about gardening, and that's why it's very rare that you ever have a national syndicated gardening show like a sports show or a political show because there's so many different geographical areas and microclimates and zones in the United States where one answer does not fit all the problem. Uh, if you have a problem, maybe you're in Texas, if you're in Portland, if you're in uh, Raleigh, you want to get a hold of your local extension office and see what they know about the problem, see what they recommend, because, because yeah, it may work well here in Milwaukee or, or South Dakota or wherever. doesn't mean it's going to work well in Phoenix or uh, Oklahoma City type of situation, so... A lot of times in gardening, a lot of things do cross over where you just have to alter the dates and times for application. But some things, it's regional and specific to that particular area of how to deal with it. Some plants are more commonly attacked by the roots or at the root. Okay, the what would those be? And that would include cherry tomatoes, potatoes, peppers, lettuce, corn, and carrots. And um, some that are more resilient to the nematodes include uh, chrysanthemums, onions, rye, and alfalfa. Well, I mean, if you're, we, we don't, and you talk about, uh, if you're unable to grow some of those crops, whether you have bad nematodes or not, you can always support your local farmer's market uh, by going and purchasing them there. Uh, but those are good to know that those, some are good and are more susceptible and others are not. And I think one thing to note is that if your plant looks sickly or poorly you're not going to bring the baby back <laughs> well no but you want to you want to figure out why yeah so, as we talked about you know tomato problems it could be something like uh, a lack of something in your soil it could be something like a nematode um there's a lot of new gardeners this year mm -hmm. and uh, everybody who's like at, talking to me about gardening i'm like it's not it's not going to be magical your first year it's this not is... it's not a PBS television show <laughs> no where you plant it in the first eight minutes and the second eight minutes you harvest it and everything's beautiful right and it one of, one, of my, one of my oldest friends she's telling me you know she's like she's got three kids whatever and she's like I will just be happy if I can just grow something and I'm like that is a really good goal and I I hope you get there and she she will but it's just like it's not going to happen instantaneously and if you end up with a bunch of greens, you end up with a bunch of greens, or maybe you end up with pounds of tomatoes. But as Joy mentioned, you definitely want to support your local farmer's market, and that that's key. And, and then, you know, just because, let, let's say you do have bad nematodes, and you are you don't properly identify, and you go, well, next year will be better. Next year will not be better because it will have the same results on the same family of plants in that area. And until you remitigate the soil, you add the diatomaceous earth, you bring in good nematodes, which you can purchase online, and you can do your research on whether you feel that you need to bring in good nematodes or just bring in good compost that has those nematodes already part of that ecosystem, then... Uh, you need to be kind of thinking of what's best for your particular growing area and your your zone there. But again, just because oh it'll it'll be better next year, it's not going to be better next year. Things don't magically create uh, a fix for itself in the garden when it comes to these plants. 
Right. And that's definitely something um, to keep in mind. And also that there is always something in your soil and it's, it's good to remember that there's good stuff and there's bad stuff and it's not just you in the garden. Right. Uh, so good nematodes. Yes. Bad nematodes. Uh, good nematodes are, are good for your garden. Bad nematodes are, uh, bad, um, for the garden. And they, there can be a balance or can be a harmony for good and bad. But if you have an overpopulation of those bad ones, you're going to see ill effects on a lot of your crops. Well, Holly, now summer's here. Temperatures are not only warming up, they're getting hot. And your garden is going to be filled with beetles, weevils, boars. And if their Japanese beetles are not knocking on your door of your garden, they're on their way. I've heard them. They've told me they're coming. They told you they're coming? They're co- yeah, they told me they're coming. Uh, so you might uh, want to kind of get ahead of the game here. And what better way to prevent these pests from destroying your garden than by controlling them while they are larvae? Grub Agon is an easy way, an easy to apply granule product that can be spread on your turf to successfully control grub invaders. Developed by Phylum Bioproducts from a naturally occurring bacteria, bacteria, Grub Gone is a non-chemical BT product that specifically targets only certain scarab pests. And it is safe to use these bees and other beneficial insects. Yes, it is all, if, if you already have the beetles flying around in your yard, Beetle Gone, is an organic water dispersible powder that you can spray directly, yes, directly on your edible plants. To find out more and where to purchase, go to phylumbioproducts.com. That's P-H-Y-L-L-O-M bioproducts.com, and they have the solution to your problem. Do not go anywhere. When we come back, new author Pam Farley will be with us. You're listening to the Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener Radio Show, a program to help your garden grow better, to maintain your landscape, make that grass look greener, your trees healthier, preserving what you grow indoors and out. You can bet the Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener's phone lines are always jammed during the show. So Joey and Holly keep their phone lines open 24-7 to help you. Call anytime, 24-7. Just dial one 800 927 7469 or just remember 1-800-927-SHOW S-H-O-W Leave a message and they will call you back Planting conditions are always favorable with the Power Planter Earth Auger. No matter what the job is, Power Planter has the right size for you. Simply attach to a drill and let the Power Planter do the work for you, creating holes fast and efficiently with ease. Find the size that fits your project at powerplanter.com Tree Ripe Citrus Company has top quality produce that comes right to your neighborhood with the freshest peaches and blueberries you'll find. To find locations, go to tree-ripe.com. Do not settle for the rest when you can have the best peaches and blueberries with Tree Ripe Citrus Company. Go to tree-ripe.com. Seed Savers Exchange has been saving, preserving, and sharing heirloom seeds since 1975 and today continues to provide those seeds to gardeners just like you. With 600-plus varieties offered in this year's catalog and 18,000 listings on their exchange, their gardener-to-gardener seed swap, Seed Savers Exchange is keeping cherished seed varieties alive. Visit SeedSavers.org to request a free catalog or to purchase seeds online for this year's growing season. That's SeedSavers.org. Tired of breaking your back while pulling weeds? Worrying about spraying chemicals around plants you want to keep? Chapin has the solution with the Weed Devil. The Chapin Weed Devil is a compact, lightweight, long-handled weed-killing machine. Powered with a rechargeable battery, you can start spraying with the touch of a button. Just choose your favorite herbicide, fill the tank, and spot spray as needed. To order the Chapin Weed Devil, visit www.chapinmfg.com. Brought to you by Blue Ribbon Organic. Organics, providing locally made organic compost and soil blends for gardens, farms, landscaping, and more. Visit BlueRibbonOrganics.com or call 262-497-8539 to find their products nearest you. Do not go anywhere. There is more of the Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener radio show to come, which is presented to you by Power Planter Earth Augers, the official digging tool. To find the right size for your digging project, visit PowerPlanter.com. Dig planting holes from a comfortable standing position. Step, twist, pull, and plant. Visit ProPlugger.com. World's Coolest Rain Gauge.com. Need I say more? 
The number one key to healthy, productive plants are the roots. Starting from seed to full-grown plants, RootMaker.com has the answer. From seed-starting trays with an innovative design that air prunes the roots, creating a fabulous root system, never again will you have root-bound plants. To multiple-gallon grow bag sizes to raised beds, RootMaker.com has your grow needs covered. Visit RootMaker.com. Use coupon code TWVG at checkout and get 10% off your entire order. The Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener Radio Show is brought to you by the following. Power Planter Earth Augers, Ivy Organics, Root Maker, Pomona Universal Pectin, Chapin Manufacturing Incorporated, Pro Plugger, Tomato Snaps, World's Coolest Floating Rain Gauge. Find all sponsors at the WisconsinVegetableGardener.com and thank them for their support. So you may still have some projects that you're trying to get accomplished, whether adding mulch, whether you're adding some gravel, whether topping off some grow areas, some grow beds, some raised beds. You can certainly get all that accomplished by getting a hold of Blue Mills Landscape and Garden Center just off of Layton and Greenfield. They've got 40 varieties of bulk material, largest in the area. You can have it delivered or based on what you're needing, you may actually be able to go pick it up yourself during during uh, the current situation. You can find Blue Mills at 4930 West Loomis Road, just off of Layton. You can give them a call at 414-282-4220, and you can check them all out at bluemills.com. Now back to the Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener Radio Show, which is presented to you by Power Planter Earth Augers, the official digging tool. To find the right size for your digging project, visit powerplanter.com. Now here are your hosts, Joey and Holly Baird. Welcome back to the Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener Radio Show. Holly, let's go to the hotline and bring in our guest for the week. Pam Farley is also known as the Brown Thumb Mama. She is a blogger, author, and small business owner. She also released an ebook recently just for new gardeners. Welcome to the program, Pam. Thanks for having me. Well, thank you for taking time out of your uh, busy schedule to join not only Holly and myself, but all of our listeners from across the country. We appreciate the time you're going to give us. Thanks. So let's talk about this uh, this ebook that you wrote, the Ultimate Beginning Gardening Bundle. What inspired you to write this book? Where was the aha moment that you said, "Hey, this is what I'm going to do, and here's how I'm going to do it"? I've always written about gardening on my blog, Brown Thumb Mama, and I'm I'm not terribly good at it, which is why I say I have a brown thumb. I don't quite kill everything. I don't quite have a booming garden either and I realized that a lot of the gardening books and information out there assumes you know things like what is direct sun do I have to plant seeds right side up super duper basic questions that people might be embarrassed to ask so I thought let's just answer as many like take take the reader by the hand answer as many questions as I can think of and help them with Super basic things like how is that? How do I know if I have enough sun? How do I know if I have enough water? That kind of thing. In the in the procedure of of writing this book, was there a certain tip or a certain piece of information that kind of shocked you? Like I never even thought about including that until I did the study for it. I asked a bunch of. Um, colleagues in my town, um, other people who were thinking about gardening and considering it, and they they didn't know when to plant what, which different zones. You know, they didn't know about climate zones and what to plant during what time of year. So I'm, I made sure to put together a list. There's a list in the bundle with every U.S. planting zone, and all of the vegetables you can plant on each individual month. So whether you're... And the other thing is that with your zones, you know, a lot of people, and I'm sure you ran into this, that people think gardening only happens in the spring and summer, and then you're done until the next year, but you can actually, in some zones, grow literally year-round. Yes. I'm in zone nine, and there is actually something we can plant every single month of the year it's fantastic that's definitely um a very versatile uh book and 
and information. Now, what are some commonly used essential oils in the garden and what are they used for? There are actually quite a few. One of the most popular ones and that my readers really appreciate is using a few drops of rosemary essential oil mixed with water in a spray bottle. And you spritz that around your garden and it keeps cats away. I love cats, but I don't like them using my garden as a litter box. Well, so short of planting rosemary plants, just spritzing some rosemary water around is a scent that they don't like and they will avoid. How how frequently do you have to apply that? After a rain or does the scent uh, last a long time? It depends on how sunny and how windy it is. I tend to go out and do it about once a week. Just um, I would rather apply it more frequently and get them not even associating my backyard as a place to be than to have it slip and have them decide, oh, that cucumber patch looks really nice and lovely. And, and another, go ahead. Move with it. Yeah. I was going to ask uh, what would be another one? Another great oil that helps with um, fungus or mildew, like powdery mildew or downy mildew is uh, melaleuca, which is also known as tea tree. 10 drops of melaleuca and one cup of water in a spray bottle. And then you only want to use that about once a week. And you want to, it can cause the leaves to be a little sensitive to sunlight. So you would want to apply it later in the day, like um, towards towards the evening so that the sun doesn't burn the leaves. Now, whenever you, you know, people are saying, well, I don't have cats. Well, a lot of times you may not have cats, but there's a lot of cats that wander around. So the application to keep them out, you want to be proactive instead of reactive because once they've established their little territory, it's hard to get a stray cat unless you physically remove it and take it somewhere. Exactly. And who's going to sit outside all day with a squirt bottle of water to, you know, to deter them yourself? It's easier to just, like you say, keep them, keep them away proactively. And it's very interesting about the uh, melaleuca tree, tea tree oil because powdery mildew is a very a very common problem for many people. So um, I know that people are always looking for some sort of solution. So you are an advocate for natural living, and that's part of the reason we asked you about the essential oil question. Mm-hmm. But also, um, what is natural living? I think some people have many misconceptions about it. And what are some ways people could live more naturally no matter where they live? That is a great question. So for me, natural living does not mean giving away everything you own and, you know, wearing sackcloth and ashes and living in a stone hut and things like that. It means quite simply to be a producer instead of a consumer. Maybe you decide to bake your own bread or you decide to grow a couple of herbs on your windowsill use essential oils, make your own natural cleaners instead of buying the chemical concoctions at the store. Those kinds of things can help reduce the, of course they reduce the plastics and the commerce and things like that. They also help you to learn skills and things that you can use. It's, it's more, Hmm. I'm trying to think of the best way to express it. Although it can be tougher to learn to bake your own bread, the sense of achievement is incredible as opposed to going to the store and buying a loaf of bread in a plastic package. Now, if I remember right, that you're not a big advocate of using bleach, but you have a recipe in which you can utilize some more natural products in order to get the same effect. Am, am I remembering this correctly? That's right. It is. There are actually a few different ways that you can naturally kill germs without bleach. The easiest one that probably everybody's going to have these items in their pantry right now is hydrogen peroxide and plain white vinegar. So what you do is you put a, either put them into a spray bottle or just screw a spray lid onto the top, keeping each one of those separate in separate bottles. You spray the vinegar onto the surface that you're disinfecting. Leave it set for a few minutes. Don't wipe it off. 
and then you spray the hydrogen peroxide on the surface again and you leave it evaporate you don't wipe it off the combination of those two of the vinegar and the hydrogen peroxide perform create parasitic acid which is effective against things like salmonella e coli and listeria there's actually an article written about it in the national institute of health it's been scientifically studied so that's that's one of my favorites there are some times when you wouldn't use that you won't use vinegar if you have granite or marble countertops and they teach you that when you when you have those countertops put in because vinegar is acidic and it can damage the stone very very interesting uh when it comes to what naturally and that's what a lot of people they they've been brought up to go to the store that's where you get the products but there's a lot of you know everything in nature has a purpose and if we understand what that purpose is we can be probably better off health wise but also financially as well exactly yeah definitely and something like using vinegar and peroxide or even just you know something even if you want to use like rubbing alcohol a bottle of rubbing alcohol to make some sort of diluted um, wipes or whatever is mm-hmm. a lot more cost effective than purchasing ones that are made pre-made for you. That, that's supposed to be flushable, but they really aren't. Well, it, <laughs> like, it, yes, I'm that, talking about like and, surface wipes, yeah. but yeah. And exactly. And the, I mean, if your kid got, you know, bleach in their eyes or anything like that, um, it's so much more damaging. So how can people find out more about you? How can people get a hold of the, the ebook that you wrote? Where can we all go to uh, learn more about you and purchase the book? So everything is available at brownsummama.com, spelled M-A-M-A. There's information about the Ultimate Vegetable Gardening Bundle, lots of new recipes like strawberry freezer jam and how to get rid of aphids naturally. So something for the gardeners, something for the natural living folks, lots of recipes. And all of my social media handles are also Brown Thumb Mama. Well, Pam, we greatly appreciate you taking time out of your day to not only enlighten Holly and myself, but all of our listeners all over the country. Thanks again. It's great to talk with you. Absolutely. And do not go anywhere. When we come back, it's about your garden questions and our garden answers. You're listening to the Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener radio show program to help your garden grow better. Got a question for Joey and Holly? Send it via email anytime to gardentalkradio at gmail.com. Pomona's Universal Pectin is a high-quality pectin that gels reliably with low amounts of any sweetener. If you're trying to reduce the amount of sugar in your diet, you'll love Pomona's Universal Pectin. Now you can make healthy homemade jams and jellies sweetened to your taste. You can use sugar or honey to sweeten. Pomona's Universal Pectin keeps indefinitely when stored in an airtight container. Easy to use, versatile, and comes with directions and recipes in every box. Find out more and where to buy at PomonaPectin.com. Also available at natural food stores and online. Chip Drop is a website you can sign up for free wood chip mulch delivery right to your door. For free, Chip Drop connects homeowners and gardeners with tree services who are trying to get rid of their wood chips. You can also sign up to get free logs and firewood. Go to ChipDrop.com to learn more and sign up for a free account. Make watering easy. DripWorks provides quality drip irrigation supplies and equipment to gardeners just like you for all your growing needs across the U.S. and Canada. Purchase online at DripWorks.com. For all your indoor growing needs, equipment, and supplies, it's WeGrowIndoors.com. Do not go anywhere. There is more of the Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener radio show to come, which is presented to you by Power Planter Earth Augers the official digging tool. To find the right size for your digging project, visit powerplanter.com. Deer Defeat is an all-natural repellent to keep deer, rabbits, and groundhogs away from your precious plants. Deer Defeat protects your plants day and night, dries clear, and odorless. It will not clog your sprayer. Deer Defeat works for 30 days through rain, snow, and freeze. Safe, effective, and works on rabbits. Money-back guarantee. To purchase, go to DeerDefeat.com and use code RADIO to save 10% on your order. Deer Defeat, it can't be beat. 
Conserve water, save time, reduce runoff, eco-friendly. Visit waterhoop.com. When it comes to bulk landscaping materials, Blue Mills Garden and Landscape Center is where everyone goes. Whatever the project, we have the materials you need with over 40 varieties to choose from. Soils, mulches, gravels, decorative stones, fresh cut sod. Blue Mills has these products in stock and ready for easy pickup or fast delivery. So what are you waiting for? Now is the time to get your yard back into shape. Stop in and pick these materials up or call us for delivery today. Nobody does bulk landscaping materials better than Blue Mills Garden and Landscape Center. Blue Mills, 4930 West Loomis Road, 414-282-4220. The Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener Radio Show is brought to you by the following. Neptune Harvest, Happy Leaf LED, Dripworks, We Grow Indoors, Deer Defeat, Harvest More, Blue Ribbon Organics, Blue Mills Landscape and Garden Center, Chip Drop. Find all sponsors at the WisconsinVegetableGardener.com and thank them for their support. Now back to the Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener Radio Show, which is presented to you by Power Planter Earth Augers, the official digging tool. To find the right size for your digging project, visit PowerPlanter.com. Now here are your hosts, Joey and Holly Baird. Welcome back to the Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener Radio Show. Thank you for being part of the program today. We greatly appreciate you hanging around. It's time to get to garden questions and garden answers. If you've got a question, you can submit it to us two ways, several ways. There's many ways, but we're going to give you two of them. You can send it to us via email at gardentalkradio at gmail.com. That's gardentalkradio at gmail.com. Or you can give us a call anytime, 24-7 at 1-800-927-SHOW, 1-800-927-SH. O-W. Got a question about cabbage here, Holly. Yeah, why are my cabbage transplants turning yellow? Well, uh, this is one of those that we talked about earlier in the program about uh, a photograph would be a little more helpful. But my first impression based on uh, personal experience would be overwatering uh, by either you or by the rain. The reason being is it's flushed out the nitrogen in the soil, not completely, not 100%, but it's it's leached that nitrogen out of the soil. And uh, to, to fix this, you can top dress it with some more compost around the plant. You can add a compost tea. You can water that in. That compost tea contains some nitrogen to it, kind of help fix the problem a little bit and, and build the microbial life up in the soil. You can use a liquid fertilizer. Uh, however, I wouldn't use a granular fertilizer for this application simply because it's not going to break down in a timely manner in which the plant can utilize it and pick it up as quick as it needs to in order to readjust the the uh, nutrients inside of the plant. Uh, so the best would be a liquid of non-organic and water it right at the roots. That would be what I would suggest with uh, any discoloration of plants. It's typically uh, when you see that lack of green, Mostly it's uh, nitrogen uh, deficiency. Okay, another question we had come in is I took an onion that had sprouted greens and planted it. Now I'm, not, now I'm starting to see the seeds flesh, flesh flower come in. So my question is should I cut the flower and let the onion develop more or should I let the seeds grow? Uh, let the seeds grow more because now that the onion has already developed a seed pod, the uh, bulb will get slightly smaller and it's already got a stalk through the root of the, the bulb. And you can utilize that bulb. However, it's not going to have a long shelf life because it will start, um, I guess, biodegrading or, or fall, uh, over time because that it's not central. It's not solid in the central portions of that bulb. Uh, so that we don't always recommend planting an onion that has sprouted simply because you do not know what variety of datelings it is. If you try, if you save an onion seed from, you know, it's a, that's a, a short day onion in the north, it's not going to do any good by growing it in the, uh, a short day onion and you try to grow it in the north, it's just going to have greens and no bulbs. So I always buy fresh seed each, each week, um, or each year, each year whenever you're going to do the onion thing. Uh, here's one for you, Holly. I was driving and listening to your show. I listened on WAAM 1600 Wham Radio out of Ann Arbor, Michigan. Thank you for that. I have poison ivy growing in and around both berry bushes uh, and landscape flora. 
Uh, your advertiser, uh, Chapin, some kind of sprayer that you can spot spray herbicide. I missed the website. Can you provide that for me? Thank you, Ron. Sure. So, uh, and we replied to him, but that would be the Chapin Manufacturing. So you go to Chapin mfg.com and it's called the weed devil you can also go to amazon and search weed devil and it pops right at the top so it's a very cool tool that it has a shield where you can just put an herbicide in the tank squeeze it, it's battery operated and it'll spray specifically where you want it no uh, blowback or drifting uh, will occur uh next question here it's a little lengthy but it's got some good points in that we uh, sh- we are going to answer and address Hello, I've been growing and learning from your videos and podcasts all spring, and I'm grateful for the information you both share with all of us. I have a problem with my tomato plants nobody has been been able to help me with. I started around 15 Rutgers tomato plants from seed this spring, and I have planted them out in the garden now. They have been growing okay. The problem is I have no idea if they're determined or indeterminate variety. The seed packet did not say. I have no other bear. Variable varieties to compare them to to see which they resemble more. And my internet searcher says Rutgers can be either depending on the specific line. I'm not sure how to prune them. If I should at all, since I'm, since I read removing suckers is only done with indeterminate tomatoes and will reduce production in determinate ones. If you have any advice how to keep them properly pruned or how to tell me what type they are, um, the plan is to let them bush out since I'd rather have extra foliage than a stunted tomato plant. So Rutgers are that funny tomato that could be indeterminate or determinate. And unless you know, your guess is as good as as The only way you're going to know what a a tomato is, either determinate or indeterminate, is at the time of fruit production. And if that plant gets to a determinate height and kind of you can visually see it stop growing or it will continue to grow and vine and, and produce more and more. Uh, so it, it's, there's no way of going, well, at this stage, that plant is a determinate, that stage, it's an indeterminate. Uh, and when it comes to the suckers, uh, it depends on who you talk to and who want, who you want to get in a fist fight with, whether or not you should prune the suckers off a tomato or not. A, they explain what a, a sucker is on a tomato for people who may not be familiar with that terminology. Sure. So a sucker is basically an extra growth on a tomato. So you're going to have the main stem or one of the main stems, and then off of that main stem, you're going to have the the branchy stem, and the sucker grows between the main stem and the branchy stem. So if you think about holding your three fingers up, it would be your middle finger. If you're holding up your pointer finger and your ring finger, and you're thinking of that like a tomato plant, the middle finger would be the sucker. And a lot of people do prune the suckers, um, especially you know if they have time. We grow, however, what do we grow, like 30-some tomato plants, we don't have the time with everything else. Some people like to. Some people say, oh, you must trim these. Some people say live and, live and let live. Well, and if you don't trim them, they will produce flowers and they will produce more fruit on the plant. So our, our philosophy is if the plant didn't want them to be there, the plant wouldn't have put that outcrop on that junction of the limb to produce more tomatoes. So it's, it's up to your decision on that. Uh, next question here, Jonah writes in, I have these leaf spots on my tomato plants. They are black uh, spots. Uh, are they, in, they are in black pots, and uh, could this be blight? Uh, I've got soil, but it's of organic potting soil. Uh, she did send a picture, and it, uh, it doesn't matter if it's organic potting soil or not. It's a soil base, and it's going to have bl- a blight in it, blights in all soil. So that is what it is. Yeah, so that to us it looked like early blight, and we we've basically answered this question in the first segment um, today. But it's maybe some people didn't tune into the first <laughs> right, segment. So right, so um, what you want to do is you want to trim the lower leaves of your tomato plants about six inches from the bottom of the plants um, and down. Then you want to take a, a handful of whole grain cornmeal and like um, place it around the base of your plant, and then you would want to mulch around the plant with straw. If you have chemical free dried grass clippings or shredded paper. And this is going to help that splash up on those plants on the leaves and prevent that early blight. Yep. Uh, that, that will fix it. Uh, I have an old cherry tree in the back. Oh, what? Bing. Uh, Bing cherry tree in the backyard. Uh, ha- I have neglected to trim it for the last several years. And new shoots have begun growing up out of the larger, lower branches. Should I trim them 
uh, way down and allow the new shoots to develop. They're talking about cutting the old ones that are not producing and, and appear to be dead. Some of the branches look dead. Uh, at this point, I'm trying to bring the tree back to life. Buds are still on the lower branches. I'm adding, um, uh, he added a picture to the, uh, to the email and asked us what I, we thought. Now, we, uh, the tree is on its way out. Yeah, the, the tree looks sad. And, and we, it's not, it's not because he neglected to trim no, it. There's other issues going on there. It looks like it, yeah, like it was, it was gonna die. It wasn't because he neglected to trim it. And we had a similar situation with our pear tree the last couple of years and now it's got like one branch of growth. So yeah, if you think your tree's, your tree's dying, it's, it probably is. Okay. Uh, yeah. And that's, uh, you need to, and you need to, and we informed, uh, him that you need to get a certified arborist and they can do, they know, I mean, they're kind of like us with, in the vegetable world. They can look at a plant and go, yeah, that has X, Y, Z. And here's what's going to happen. Typically, whenever a large portion of a tree has lost life and is not producing foliage in the period of time in, in, in the summer months, you're, it's not going to come back. You have to take that that Bing cherry tree out to the back 40 and put out of its misery. Yeah. Uh, this year, uh, here's a straw bell question for you, Holly. Uh, this year, uh, just like most other years, uh, I planted a, planted peas and beans in my straw bell, uh, and they had very poor germination. I got the seeds from a reputable seed company and put a layer of soil on top of the straw bell and, uh, and with organic matter, my, and they b- did very poorly. My tomatoes and potatoes did awesome, but for some reason, I only got three or four peas and a few bean seeds to germinate uh, to grow nicely. Any idea why this has occurred with the straw bell? Well, what you want to do is you want to take um, the uh, planting mix, a potting mix, and make a thin layer on the top of that bale, and then it will germinate into the bale at a certain point. You want to work that soil into that top layer, too, so yeah. that roots can penetrate, not through just the soil, but as it, as the soil is worked into that bale, the roots will go follow that soil into the bale, and then if the bale is conditioned correctly, which is uh, the, the creation of uh, humus inside of that bale, that's the feeding mechanism for the plants. So whenever she planted her tomatoes and potatoes in there, it was already in that humus, but the beans hit that rough straw because the soil wasn't worked into that top, in the top bit, and they just kind of pe- petered out. They didn't do anything. So uh, keep, keep in mind whenever you're doing that, uh, Joe Carson, who was a, a guest on our program and has several great books on how to grow, garden in a straw bale, and the number one failure is I just put a, a, a bale out in the garden, watered it, and planted it, and that's not how that works at all. Sometimes you got to give uh, you, you know, a little help. So we are out of time, and we thank you for yours. Miss any portion of this show, or you want to revisit it, you can do that by going to the WisconsinVegetableGardener.com and clicking on the Radio Season 4 tab at the top of the page. Or you can send us an email at Garden Talk Radio, and we will send you the link to this show. Uh, you can just, you know, the one with brown thumb mama, uh, talking about tomato problems. You, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll know what you mean. Uh, you can also, uh, find all other content at our website, the Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener.com in garden videos as well as in studio videos. Uh, join us next week on the program where we'll be talking about canning what you grow, what you need to know and what you make sure you do and not do. Also gardening in the effects for positive mental health are Guest will be Marion Nessel will be with us and your garden questions will get answered. Be sure you tell your friends that this program is on the radio as that's how our message gets heard and spread by word of mouth. So until next week for Holly Baird, I'm Joy Baird and we will see you in the garden.